Welcome back to the show, sir. Happy to be back. Interesting. You were the third guest on my show. I was. You were also one of the only... In fact, you are the only Republican who supports Trump who's come back to the show post-Trump winning. Huge bravery. <laughs> so brave, Chris. So, so brave. brave. You also so got brave. nothing to lose, which helps. Well, you know, listen, it's... <laughs> 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 you know... Sometimes that's when you're bravest, Trevor. That you know? is when right. you're bravest, right? right? Never know. How do, you, how do you feel about these Republicans who seem to be pro-Trump or with him, and then when they're leaving, all of a sudden they're like, he is the worst thing in the <laughs> world? And it seems like bravery does happen when the people leave. Uh, yeah, when, you, you know, you don't have to look at them every day or something, right. I guess. I guess that's probably it. Um, but, you know, they weren't brave in the beginning, you know, and, and, and what they're doing now is just... Faux bravery, so oh, that's, that's the way it goes. Hurricane Sandy was, for you, one of the most seminal moments in your life and, and, and your career. Um, it's interesting because you, you went on this roller coaster ride of approval ratings. Hurricane Sandy, around that time, people said, Chris Christie could be the next president of the United States. I recall that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, a while later, like, this picture was one of those that made you one of the most hated men. Yeah in the United States when, like, a beach was shut down and there was, you know, a shutdown and, yeah. and you were out on the beach with your family. Mm -hmm. what, what was that like, just genuinely from your side as a human being, going from, like, everyone loving to you to feeling like everyone hates you? Try to make me cry. <laughs> oh, but no, no, but I'm no, serious. No, though. I mean, listen, seriously, like, that's, that's often what political life is like. You know, very rarely is there somebody in political life who does anything that's worth anything. Right. That remains popular all the way through. It, it, because... If you're doing stuff that matters and stuff that needs to be done in your state or in this country, you're going to anger some people. You have to. Because unless you're just giving everything away, unless you're just saying yes to everybody, even if you don't mean it, you're going to make some people angry. Um, and so, you know, to me, like, it's never fun. Mm -hmm. Like, you always would much rather be 75% than 15%. Right. But in the end, does it really matter? Like, I, to me, what matters is what you did. And what you accomplished. And, and so for me, that's what always mattered the most. No one likes it. Anybody who says they like being unpopular at times is just completely full of it. I didn't like it. But I also tried to have some perspective on it. That that wasn't why I did it in the first place anyway, mm -hmm. was to be popular. And I used to tell my folks when we were at 75%, like, we're not keeping this in the desk drawer and, like, just looking at it and go, look how pretty that 75% is. Let's go spend it. Let's go do the difficult things. That'll bring that down. And then you got to live with it. You've written a book. Let yeah. me finish. Trump, the Kushners, Bannon, New Jersey, and the power of in-your-face politics. You take us through a little bit of how you began, a little bit of your life, the journey that made you into Chris Christie, as people know you. And then you really get into the meat of the presidential campaign, from you announcing, from you going into the race, all the way through to dropping out, and then the story with Donald Trump. Right. Let's start at the beginning of this journey, when yep. you were running and Donald Trump was running. You, you guys had been friends for a while. Yeah, at, at that time, we'd been friends for about 14 years. Did you think he stood a chance? No. Why not? I thought the whole thing was a joke at the time. I really did. I mean, you know, he had been talking about running for president for a long time. Right. I mean, going back 20 years. And so when he finally... He, look, he was getting older. And when he finally declared, I thought to myself, well, he's not going to stay in. Uh-huh. I mean, this is going to be something where he's going to do it for a little while, get into a debate or two experience it and then go, eh, I don't need this, I'm going to go away. So the whole premise of me, and not just me, but most of the other men and women that were up on that stage yes. was like, all right, he's getting some attention now, but he can't be serious about this. Is, is, is that why you guys didn't work as hard to attack him? It felt like everyone was leaving him and, and it was like, ah, oh, forget him, he's fun. You know what it really was? Part of the problem was there were so many of us, and he had so much uh, popularity in the polls early. Yes that all the rest of us, there was just a little bit left for everybody. So you remember when people would go to attack him, like Rand Paul went to attack him, one thing he goes, and he would look at him and go, you're a 2%, you're nothing, you're never yes, going to win League yes. alone, right? Uh, or... You shouldn't even be on the stage. You shouldn't be on the stage. Who yes. are you? That kind of thing. And, and everybody saw that happening, and the media would react to that and play it over and over again. So it would be like, wow. you know, getting, getting, you know, sand kicked in your face, not just once, but like a hundred times. And so people said, well, let's wait. The strategy of everybody was, let's wait so we're down to the last few, and then we'll go after him. Uh -huh. the, but, when, the, but when you saw that happening, when you, when you saw Trump becoming a viable candidate, it, it, you, the, the race changed quite a bit. Did it change your friendship? You know, interestingly, no, because we never, except for one instance that I detail in the book. Right. Um, Which, what is that instance? Well, that instance was, 
Uh, I got the, the endorsement of the Manchester Union Leader in yes. New Hampshire, which is the biggest newspaper in New Hampshire and the biggest endorsement to get in the primary. And he was really pissed. Right. And so he was in South Carolina when it happened. And, he, and then he gives some speech saying that, oh, you know, Bridgegate, he knew all about it. Right. I know he knew about it. He had breakfast with these people every morning. What were they talking about? It was all made up. Right, all made up. But how, how does that, how do you still stay friends with somebody who's accusing you of being part of something that is a crime? Well, part of what, part of it is politics, right? I mean, people accuse people of everything in politics sometimes, and if you break every relationship you have with someone who says something bad about you, you're gonna be eating dinner alone in politics because it's a nasty game. But also what happened was when he did that, then I went after him. So I was in Iowa yes. when he did that. That night I went after him and I said, listen, Donald Trump said a whole bunch of lies about me today. Let me tell you the truth. We're, we don't need a wall. Uh -huh. We're never going to build a wall, even uh -huh. if he's elected. And if we ever did build a wall, I can guarantee you one thing. Mexico ain't ever going to pay for it. Right. And, you know, the crowd... Do you still believe all of those things? I, listen, I, it, it looks like I was right. Um, do you, no, but do you, still, do you still believe all of those things? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. Listen, that's what I ran on. I, I, don't, think, I don't think we need those things. Um, do we need some more security at the border? Of course we do. And I think everybody agrees on that. Right. Um, but do we need what he was talking about then, which was a concrete wall yes. from one end of the border to the other? <laughs> no. And, and I said that at the time. Right. And, and now he doesn't even say anymore yes. that that's now what we need. Now he says a fence. Right, a fence, a fence or, wall. or steel slats yes. or something like that. But, but the point like was, a stern when, when, no. right, when, when I went after him, the next morning, Corey Lewandowski, who was campaign manager at the time, called my campaign manager and said, listen, Donald's really um, sorry. He didn't mean to say any of that. He knows it was wrong. He knows that th that wasn't true. And he wants a truce. And so I said to my guy, if he wants a truce, he calls me. And so he called me, and he admitted. He never he didn't mean it. He knew it wasn't true. He was just angry, and he apologized. So let me ask you this then. You, you get to that point yep. where you've, you've now... Okay, fine. And then there's, he didn't say anything anymore, by right, the way. Right, right. There's, there's been a truce. But then you were the first prominent Republican to stand behind Donald Trump. Like, yeah. I'll never forget, there was this, the debate that we watched together where out of nowhere, it was like watching the Royal Rumble, we thought you would be going after him, and then you just kicked Marco Rubio in the jaw, basically took him out of the race, <laughs> Yeah. and you, you backed Trump. You, you well, backed that happened him. after it. Yeah. Right, but I'm saying, you backed him. Did you genuinely believe at that time that this man was the best man to be president of the United here's, States? Here's what I believed. I believed that he was going to win. That he was going to win the Republican nomination. He had come in second place but in Iowa. But did you believe that he deserved to win? Well, like... hold, no, I thought I deserved to win. Touche. <laughs> 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 right? All right. I mean, so, you know, because I get asked this question a lot for right. obvious reasons. And I go, let's be clear here. He was not my first choice for president. Right. I was. <laughs> right? So, but then I was trying to be practical. I looked at it and I said, none of the rest of these guys on the stage are going to beat him. They're just not. After he came in second place in Iowa, but one New Hampshire think, two to one. But you were part of that prophecy. No, it was over by then. When he won New Hampshire, South Carolina by double digits. Yes. In, in fields of 12, 13 people. It's over. It's just over. I knew it was over. And I sat there with my wife on the couch watching South Carolina. And I said, listen, we've been friends with this guy for 14 years. He's going to be the nominee. We got two choices. Either stay on the sidelines or support him and try to make him a better candidate. And I thought I could talk to him in ways that nobody else could talk to him uh -huh. because of the 14-year friendship. That, like, for instance, when he was doing all the stuff with Judge Curiel. Yes. I was the guy who got called in by his family to talk to him and say, you have to stop this. Right. It's not right. It's not right to go after this judge because he's a Mexican-American. Stop it. Put out a statement saying you're going to stop it and don't do it anymore. And I got called in to do that, and I did it, and I convinced him to put out a statement saying he wouldn't do it anymore, and he didn't do it anymore. So it's interesting. You say you wanted this man to be a better candidate, and you thought you could help him. Yep. The book is really I engaging, and it's, it's an interesting insight into the world that you have and Trump has and the people around him have, especially when it comes to the Kushners, because the way you lay it out in the book, you yep. make it sound like Jared Kushner has the power in the White House. I mean, well, you, he, you... He, is, he is the most powerful person in the White House next to the president. And you argue that you didn't get the job as vice president because of Jared Kushner. Sure. That's exactly why. Listen, the, the Wednesday night before the president, uh, the now president, um, announced his running mate on a Friday, I was in Washington, D.C., working on the transition. He called me that night on the phone. He said, are you ready? I said, am I ready for what? He goes, you know what I'm talking about. Are you ready? And I said, well, if you ask, I'm ready. And he said, well, talk to Mary Pat and make sure she's okay. I'm going to make my announcement tomorrow.
Now, I don't know, Trevor. <laughs> that sounds to me like it's going to be me. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and then about two hours later, a high-level staff person on the campaign that was with him called me and said, he just called the family and told them that it's going to be you. And Jared and Ivanka have said they're getting on a plane at 6 a.m. to Indianapolis to come and talk to him and tell him he's got to go see Mike Pence again. So I don't know if it was Jared who made sure that I wasn't vice president, but then they went to see Pence, and then I didn't get it. Right. So, 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 so let, let's, let's look at that part in the book, because this, yes. this is really fascinating, where you talk about this moment between the two of you. There's a lot of tension that's happening here. Jared comes to you at one point and basically says to you, to your face, he says, this is basically for what you have done to my father. Right. When because the, you, you were basically responsible for putting his father in jail. No, let's be clear. His father was responsible for going to jail. <laughs> No, putting him in jail. The, the, he, what he yes. did, what he did, put him semantics. in jail. Semantics. Yes, I'm. With no, you. not semantics. I'm with... Really important. Right. Because when you say, when someone says a prosecutor put someone in jail, I did my job. Right. My job is when people break the law in my state, and I have the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that they did, then they go to jail. Whether they're the richest guy in the state, which is what he was at the time, mm -hmm. or whether they're a low-level drug dealer, um, you know, who committed a crime and right. killed somebody, they go to jail. So you think it was a you think it was him enacting his vendetta? He was he was saying you're not going to be vice president because of what you did to my dad. Right. And, and listen, that's not when he had to talk with me. It was earlier than that when Trump was making me the chairman of the transition, which was yes. in May. He came into Trump's office uninvited, and made the argument in front of me to his father-in-law that I couldn't be chairman of the transition because I was untrustworthy because I had pursued his father and put him in jail and that that was a family matter that should have been resolved by the rabbis and not by a prosecutor. Do you, do you think that you would have been... Yeah, I, I reacted the same way, by the way. Do you, do, do you think... Because if you, if you asked it the other way, you find, like, uh, Jared and them would have said, um, oh, no, but, you know, Mike Pence was a better VP because Trump was so you know, just so caught up in all of his scandals, the pussy tape, et cetera. You wanted someone <laughs> next to him... Remember, they didn't was... know about that tape then. Right, but I'm saying <laughs> they wanted somebody who was the squeaky clean Bible guy, and they were like, oh, maybe Chris Christie's not the right VP to have next to Trump. Well, He's I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not the Bible guy, but... It, but hey, I'm from New Jersey, but... The, the... <laughs> but... But nonetheless, like, the point is, that should be the president's choice. Yes. And it shouldn't have to worry about me having... And, and Trump said it that day in the meeting because he made me chairman of the transition. Right. And he said to Jared, you can't blame him for doing his job. He was just doing his job. And let me remind you what this guy did. I mean, besides tax evasion and, and violating federal election laws, when he found out we were investigating him and that his sister had been called to the grand jury because she was part of the owner of the company, he sent... He hired a prostitute to go after his sister's husband, seduce his sister's husband, videotape it, and then he took the videotape and sent it to his own sister on the day of her son's engagement party to intimidate her from going and speaking in front of the grand jury. Now, listen, I know some families have problems, <laughs> but I, and, and my family has been one that's like, you know, we, we, we talk and, we're, and we're, we're, we'll battle with each other. Right. And, right, I never hired a hooker. <laughs> Right? Uh, to go and videotape it and send it to my sister. I mean, so we're not talking about, oh, you know, a parking ticket. Yes. And my point to Jared and to anybody who's ever asked me about this is, you know, when you do something like that, you have to be held accountable. And by the way, it wasn't a jury that found him guilty. He pled guilty. He admitted guilt to 18 counts. Right. So... My so, point is, like, you've got to let... The, I understand it's his father. Nobody would want their father to go to jail. Uh -huh. I totally understand that. But at some point, as you get older, you've got to understand that, well, I'm an adult now, and my father has to take responsibility for his own conduct, and I can't blame the guy who was just doing his job. Let's, let's talk about the transition before I let you go. Yeah. Because this is one of the parts of the book that I genuinely was, was, was engrossed by. You talk about how you spent a really long time compiling a giant dossier of, like, what your transition team would be, what Trump's transition should look like, yep. all of the people who would help him to become president. Yep. You then get kicked off the transition team. Yep. They throw away all of your work. Yeah. And as we saw, the transition was a disaster. Total. Right? Do you think that you could have helped Donald Trump to become presidential, the thing that people have been searching for from the very beginning. Well, I don't know about that. Um, 
But I think what, what we could have done was gotten him off to a much better start and, and put more good people around him. You know, there's that old saying, right, garbage in, garbage out. Yes. Right? So if you have a bunch of people around you who are not good, mm -hmm. it significantly decreases your ability to be good. But let me ask you this. You, you say in the book, this was interesting, because in the book, there's a passage where you talk about Trump and you say he's not a good judge of character or he makes, or he makes um, rash decisions. You say he's impulsive. very impulsive. Yes, impulsive. he's impulsive. Yeah. And you say he surrounds himself with guys who are, you know, con men and people who are shady and people who are just not, you know, the right people to be some around. Of them are. Yeah, right, some right, of them. right. But then did you never not ask yourself that question, like, why does he want me around then? No, well, <laughs> apparently he didn't. Um, but it's not like all the people around him are bad. And, and it's not like every decision, personnel decision he makes is bad. But the problem is that if you don't have the, the process set up to vet people, right? So right. they threw all that away. And so, you know, they were like vetting people on Google. I mean, and, and you can't do that because what happens is you miss things. And someone can sit across from you in a, in a meeting and impress you one day in, in an hour or uh -huh. two hours. And they may seem okay. And we've all met people like this. And then all of a sudden you find out other stuff about them. You do a little research. You go, oh, yeah, that guy's, that guy's not good. Right. And you move on. He threw that entire process away. Jared, Steve Bannon, Rick Dearborn, those three guys took 30 volumes. It's not just my work. We had 140 people, all volunteers, working from May till November yes. to put together 30 binders of stuff on you know, so they wouldn't have had to write on, on, a, a, no, I'm with, on everything, you, on an everyone. executive order on the back right, of an envelope right, that right. was going to get thrown out of court on some kind of travel ban right. scam, right? right? I'm with you, but, but let me let me ask you this then. Let me ask you this. You, you, you're in a position where, as Chris Christie, you are friends with Donald Trump, the man who's about to become president of the United States, or has a good chance of becoming yeah. president of the United States. You are engaging with him in debate prep. You yep. talk about in the book where you are out with this man and you're playing golf. And the reason you're playing golf is because you realize that he does not want to sit down and read anything. So you think you can trick him into learning things before the next debate, essentially. Well, no, not trick him, but, but I, what I began to understand and learn was that he learned much better verbally than he did in writing. So that if we sat and had a conversation, <laughs> it's true. And then, you know, some people, and over- But at this point, and you, at this point, you're like, this man should be the president of the United States? No, remember, <laughs> hold on, remember, remember what I said. He was going to be the Republican nominee. He was going to be. Right. Was, that was over. So in your head, you're, in your head, so, you're so going, I have to try to fix this, basically. That's, I want to make it better. And you thought you going to be the nominee. Well, damn, man, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think I could. Right. right away, like this, I wasn't getting paid. Um, and and I, I, my point was, I love the country. This is going to be, this guy's going to have a 50-50 shot to be president. Right. So let's try to make him as good as we can make him. And let's see if we can make this work. And when you were with him on the golf course, you guys are playing, and between holes, you're we trying to brief... We weren't playing, because I don't play. Oh, so you're just trying to brief him between no, holes. No, what happened was we went to the golf course for lunch. Yes. And I said to him, listen, we need to talk about the health care reform right. stuff. So where do you want to do that? And he goes, well, have you ever seen the course? And I said, no, I've never seen this course. He goes, well, let's get in the golf cart, and we'll ride around, and we'll talk. And what happened, and that's an interesting part of the book... I started to try to talk to him about it. He didn't want to talk about it. What he wanted to talk about was that he was concerned that, like, this might really happen. I, I might win. And he said, <laughs> yeah. And he said to me, like, I'm concerned. This is <laughs> so says, crazy, right, man. Right. I'm sorry, man. And he says, well, listen, I, I, think if you, I think if you talk to President Obama, President Bush 43, President Clinton, that there, there comes a moment when, when you're running, you want to win. Right. But then there's a moment when it goes, whoa, I may actually win. Right. I personally never got to that moment. <laughs> but <clears throat> I wished I'd gotten that moment, but I didn't. That's a different moment. And what he was saying to me that day was, he was talking to me about, I've run a family business. I've taken care of my kids. I'm worried about what's going to happen uh -huh. when I'm not there every day, and they have to do this, and they're going to do, are they going to do well or not? Is this going to work out? And we sat there talking for instead of talking about health care reform, we sat there for about an hour riding around this course talking about being a father. So when you when you and what that and, and what right. your responsibility is in public because he had never been in public life before. So he's asking me, like, listen, you've been doing this for a long time. How do you make time to see your kids? How do you deal with the things they need from you when you've got this really important job? Uh -huh. It's not the kind of conversation that most people think Donald Trump would want to, would be having. And that's one of the reasons I put it in the book. It started off as a bad story. Like, he, he didn't want to talk about health care reform. Right. But in the end, we talked about something that, in a personal way, was, was meaningful. Yes. And, and something that I think most people 
wouldn't think of him, and that's one of the reasons I put it in the book, because we know all the stuff we know, yes. all the tweeting and the stuff that you were talking about for the first half hour right. of the show. But that's something that most people wouldn't know, and that because I was his friend and around then, I had a window into and I thought was important to share with the public so that they got more information about the guy who's sitting in the Oval Office. So then let me ask you this. Yeah. If he was to call you today and say, Chris, I need you. Remember that night that I called you? I should have followed through. I should have given you the ring. <laughs> will you... Or the rose or whatever. Will you <laughs> come and join me at the White House? I need you in my administration. Would you say yes? He's offered me six different jobs since he's there, and I've said no to all of them. Why? Because there were no jobs that he offered me that I wanted. And Which job would you want? I told him way back, and I put this in the book, when I endorsed him a day or two later when we were campaigning around together, he said to me, hey, if I win this thing, what do you want? And I said, there's only two jobs that I'm interested in, vice president or attorney general. Uh -huh. That's it. I said, those are the two jobs that I think I'm most qualified for and the ones that would excite me the most and where I think I could do the most good. Uh -huh. I'm not looking for another title. I got plenty of titles. So I, let me ask I, you this. Would you, would, you, would you run for president again? You never say never. Would, I you, mean, would you run against Trump? Do you think in you could 2020? Beat, do you think you could beat him? No. In a primary in 2020? Probably, no, do you think any think Republican so. could beat him? I don't think so. Not now. Now, listen, politics is a dynamic thing, and you never know. Right. But based on what we see right now, no, I think you're the incumbent president. It's very hard to beat an incumbent president in a primary. Um, and, and he's still highly popular among Republican Party voters. I think the last poll I saw had him at like 80 or 81 percent approval right. among Republicans. So if 81 percent of the people like the guy you're running against, that only leaves 19 percent for you. Um, so that's not, good, that's not a good game to play. So no. But I'm 56 years old. Would I think about doing it again? I, oh, of course I would think about it, but only if I saw a reasonable path to win. Like, I don't want to be one of these guys who runs just because, like, hey, why not? Let's run. Mm -hmm. It's too hard to do that, and it's too important. I didn't run in 2012, despite a lot of people asking me to do it, right. because I didn't feel like I was ready. I had an antiquated view of the presidency at that time, apparently. And now you're like, it's a free-for-all. Now I'm like, what? Yeah, kind of, I, I had 15 months as governor. I was overqualified. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, but at the time, I had 15 months as governor, I thought, like, I can't do this. Like, this is ridiculous. This is not right. And maybe politically, I had a good chance to, to, to win right. the nomination. I felt like, in your heart, you got to believe that you can win and that if you win, that you're qualified to do the most important job in the world. That's the way I feel about it. So the answer to your question is, yeah, I'd think about it, but only if I thought that I had a path to win. And if I didn't, then you have no business going out and asking people for money and asking people for, the, for their vote. Right. They're just not right. I will say this. Um, we haven't always agreed on everything. We fight and argue about stuff, but I've always appreciated that you come on the show and that you talk. Listen, you're great. Thank and you And I love coming here. on the show, and Thank I love you so what much, you do. Sir. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let me finish. It's a fascinating book, and it's available now. Governor Chris Christie, everybody.